to introduce Robert Carver. He is the author of Systematic Trading, a unique new method for designing trading and investing systems, which was published by Har Harriman House. Until 2013, Robert worked for AHL, which is a large systematic hedge fund and part of the Man Group. He was responsible for the creation of AHL's fundamental global macro strategy, and then managed the fund's multi-billion multi dollar fixed income portfolio. Prior to that, Robert worked as a research manager of CEPR, an economics think tank, and traded exotic derivatives for Barclays Investment Bank. Robert has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Manchester, and a master's degree also in economics from Birkbeck College, University of London. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I'm going to come down from the podium because I walk around a lot during my talks, and if I stay on there, I'll probably break something. Um, so I want you to imagine for a moment that we manufactured cars the same way that most people create trading strategies. So we'd have the, you know, the GM factory or the Ford factory, and there'd be all these part spins everywhere. You'd send robots in. They'd pull out all kinds of combinations of different parts and sort of try and assemble them into a car. So you'd have some cars with one wheel, some with two, some with no steering wheel instead of like a normal wheel, um, somewhere the engine was, was in the back seat not connected to anything. Uh, and then you'd get all of these different variations of cars and you'd line them all up and you'd make them all do a quarter mile drag race. And of course, most of them wouldn't even move, but the ones that were moving, um, you'd then pick the fastest and say, right, this is the best car. I mean, it sounds kind of nuts, but that's a pretty good metaphor for the way that we create trading strategies. So I'm going to try and describe to you today a better way. Um, normal stuff you have to read. So where does this kind of idea that this is the way we should do it come from? So what I want you to do is pretend you've got a time machine and go back quite a few years to when I got started in this business. Um, and I was given the uh, great opportunity to become uh, an intern at AHL. And if you want to know what I looked like at that time, Mel, could you stand up, please? So. Melk was actually my intern <laughs> uh, at AHL a few years ago, and, or Fitting Monkey, as we, we called them at the, you know, very, at the time. Um, so I looked exactly like him. I had all, all my hair. I looked amazing. Um, so I was given this opportunity. I didn't really know much about the industry. So I went and you know, bought the usual books. But I also found this book here. Um, now, normally, when an author is doing a presentation, they, they kind of try and push their own book. But I'm actually going to try and push this book, because it's a great book if you've not read it. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from it. Prediction company begins to sound like a creature endowed with a voracious appetite for numbers. It hungers after data to be analyzed, massaged, cleaned, transformed, patterned, mapped, propagated. I mean, the author's clearly got a very good thesaurus, right? Um, <laughs> networked, graphed, plotted, and scattered through state space until out the back of this massive number crunching machine comes another number indicating buy or sell. Um, and you read that and you think, Wow, so that, that's how systematic trading works. That's how you design trading strategies. Um, and the way of thinking about this is that you start with a bunch of data, and you have this magic box that we'll talk about more in a second. And the box is deliberately black, because it's, it's a black box, with all of the connotations that it has. And out comes a trading strategy. And a nice way of thinking about a trading strategy it consists of an algo plus some parameters. So the algo is just the rules that say, if x happens, do y. Um, and the parameters are you know, numbers you can tweak um, within that algo to make it behave slightly differently. Now, this is called data first, because you start with the data. And you know, think about our keynote speech this morning. Um, you know, this is exactly this approach. You start with a bunch of data, and you, you, out the bottom falls the strategy that you follow. OK, why is this bad? Well, it involves fitting. And um, it's well known that fitting is something that's good in moderation, but really bad if you overdo it or overfit. Um, and this is a fairly classic picture from a fairly classic book. And this has been done by a statistician. So um, instead of the normal, normal way we think about things, higher up on the y-axis is actually bad. Uh, low on the y-axis is good because it's low prediction error. Um, so if you just focus on this purpley pink line first, um, the more complexity you put in your model, so the more degrees of freedom you have in your fitting, the better the model will perform in sample, lower prediction error, until eventually it actually asymptotes to zero. Um, but the outer sample performance will be, you know, it starts off improving. It's never going to be quite as good as the pink line by construction. It starts off improving and then gets gradually worse and worse and worse. Um, and there's this optimal point here. And this is like the optimal amount of fitting you can do. And um, the, the problem is that we don't really know where this point is. 
and we usually make um, an error in assuming that it's much further over to the right. In other words, we think we can do more fitting than the, the data will really let us. Right, there are three types of fitting. So the, the kind of fitting that most people think about is what I call explicit fitting. Um, so that's, if you think about the keynote this morning again, it's where the, you let the computer do the fitting for you. So you, you let the computer select from you know, all of the randomly produced cars or trading strategies and variations. Um, and explicit fitting is it's kind of OK if you do it right. If you do it badly, obviously, you end up overfitting. Now, the second form of fitting is implicit fitting. And this is where you do the fitting. And you may even be doing it subconsciously and not realizing. But any time you look at a training strategy on a computer and look at its performance and then make a decision to throw it away or change it in some way, you've just made a fitting decision. And you've just effectively done an in-sample fit. Um, and that's bad. That's really bad. You should never do that if you can. Now, the final kind of fitting is called what I would call tacit fitting. And this basically means that even if you, you're going to got me and drop me into a room with, with no access to, to any data and say, right, construct a trading strategy, there's a whole bunch of stuff about finance that I know and that everyone knows. that certain things are more likely to work than others. Um, so you have all of this knowledge, this tacit knowledge inside your head. Um, and in a true um, out-of-sample test, you wouldn't have had that. So you wouldn't have been able to, to land at the beginning of time before any financial data series started to arrive and immediately know in advance, oh, well, I know momentum works, so I'm going to build a momentum training strategy. So you're already doing some kind of overfitting. Now, the thing about tacit fitting is you can do absolutely nothing about it um, ex unless you have some kind of explicit fitting, probably not very nonlinear machine learning, that um, has got no constraints on what kind of strategy will pop out the other end. That's quite difficult to implement in practice. Um, so what kinds of tacit knowledge are there? So um, this, this theory, this stuff you can read in, in books. Um, there's previous research that's been done by people and published either by, um, you know, by academics or by people in investment banks. There's what I call market folklore. So you know, even if no academics had, had written about uh, trend following, um, and even if no one had ever written a word on it, um, I think most people in this room would know that it existed, for example, because you know, it's just been part of the market for so long. Uh, and finally, just, you've got common sense. So it's common sense that if you can design a trading strategy that buys low and sells high, you'll make money, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Right, so I think people should do less fitting and more designing. So what is designing rather than fitting? So when you design, you basically say, well, I've got all this tacit knowledge. I'm not going to try and ignore it. I'm going to embrace it and use it. Um, I'm not going to do any implicit fitting at all. Um, and then I'm going to do the absolute minimum amount of explicit fitting fitting, and I'm going to do it in the correct way. So the difference here is we start with an idea. It's not data first, it's the idea that comes first. Mm -hmm. um, and that idea is probably something that's come from all of this tacit knowledge. So I'm, well, I'm 43 minus epsilon, where epsilon's like 11 days now. Um, so I'm a bit older and I've lost most of my hair. Not, not because of working in a hedge fund business, but from having three kids. Um, so this is how I would design a trading strategy now. So it's ideas first. And instead of this black fitting box, I've got this transparent design process. And instead of just data going into it, I've, I have got some real data. But I've also got some tacit knowledge. And I've also got some fake data, which I'll talk about more in, in a minute. Um, by the way, if, if you've, you've seen me even in the past probably blog about fake data, and I used to call it random data, but I thought it would be a nice reference to kind of contemporary American politics to call it fake data. Um, and out of the, the end pops the same thing, a training strategy with some algorithms and some parameters. Um, now, this is much more how people design cars, and indeed any real products. Um, they, they have some theories. So for example, you know, we know that the internal combustion works because people have obviously designed them, but also done a lot of research in, into how they work. We know about you know, the aerodynamics of how a car, best design a car to get, get it to be really fuel efficient. Um, you know, the people do market research. They say, well, what kind of car would you like? Um, this previous product. So, you know, we, we can start off with the fact that we know that a car should probably have four wheels and, on each corner, and you know, that reduces the amount of cars we need to look at. Um, we also could have focus groups and design prototypes. So we can do all of these, these things. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about trend following this presentation. Now, I'm a bit reluctant to, because I've realized, actually, that I've kind of become a bit pigeonholed as, oh, you're the trend following guy. Um, and um, I'm, I'm so much more than that. Um, <laughs> But it's true that I did used to work for a trend-following fund, and I feel I know a lot about trend-following. Um, but more importantly, I think 
everyone understands trend following. It's the, one of the simplest trading strategies you can have apart from buy and hold. So, um, you know, I think it's a good example to use. Um, so what kind of tacit knowledge would you have in you know, if you were starting out on a journey to design a trend following strategy? Well, you'd have market fol folklore. So, you know, you, you read things in books like Jesse Livermore's book, which is like over 100 years old now, saying things like, oh, cut your losers and let your winners run. Or, Don't fight the tape. Um, and obviously, we've got the, the kind of uh, historical record of the turtle traders, um, which, a story which has been told many times. Uh, and then there's all these businesses that have been doing this. So you've, you've kind of got the US CTAs, the UK CTAs, and the European CTAs. So this idea of trend following independently arose on you know, kind of two, three, two or three different places. Um, and then there's the, the, the kind of the research that the people have done on it. So the earliest decent paper I could find was from 1960. But, but more recently, um, you know, there's, it's been added to the classic kind of pharma French uh, three-factor model as a fourth factor by Carhartt. Um, and then you've got the theory. So why does momentum work? So you've, you've got the work of the behavioral finance guys saying, well, you know, it, it's, it could be because of prospect theory. People value gains and losses differently. It could be because of herding or confirmation bias under reaction. Um, and we also know that certain funds trade in the market in such a way that creates trends. So for example, um, you know, risk parity funds um, might trade in such a way that trends are created um, at some time scales and mean reversion at other time scales. OK, but it's very easy to say, oh, trend following is very simple. But actually, there's a whole bunch of unanswered questions we still have to answer. So I'm going to stand over here now and give you guys some love. Um, what period of time do trends last for? When should we enter them? When should we exit them? Should we have a stop loss rule? And what is it? How do we identify markets that are or aren't trend friendly? Um, how do we identify how strong the trend is? What size should our positions be? Uh, in, in other words, you know, what, what is the algo, the trend following algo we're going to use, and what parameter should it have inside it? Um, that's a lot of unanswered questions that we need to answer in our design process. Um, now, the data, the data first guys, you know, they, they've, it's very easy. They just come up with a set of possible algorithms that, that they think might identify trends, some possible parameters, the data, put it in the magic fitting box, and out comes the best strategy, which will be the best algo with the best parameters. So what is the best strategy? We ask most finance people, they give you the data first answer, which is oh, it's, it's the thing that gives you the best return versus risk. Um, and if you assume that you can um, do any amount of leverage and you assume a risk is Gaussian, that then comes out as being the highest Sharpe ratio. Um, if those things aren't true, you need to use other measures. Um, so the, imp the important point here is that it's a very narrow view of what's best. The best strategy is the one that does, makes the most money. End of story. Um, and there's also a very narrow view of what information you should use to actually create it, which is just past data. Now, when you're designing something, in this idea is first, it's much richer. So I'm not necessarily interested in the best performing strategy in sample in the past. Um, I'm interested in the best design strategy. So I'm going to look at lots of metrics, not just performance, which I will look at, but turnover, how it behaves in given scenarios. Does it look like a trend-following strategy? In other words, you know, if, if I push a price series through it that has a trend in it, does it capture that trend? If I push a price series through it where the market's really choppy, does it lose money? You know, does it do those things that it's expected to do? Um, and we're going to use multifaceted sources of information. So we're going to use all of this tacit knowledge, so common sense, theoretical principles, um, some fake data, and we're going to use some real data, but in the, we're going to use the absolute minimum of real data. But because I like to think of real data as this kind of horrible, contaminating product. And when you bring it anywhere near your training strategy, you're, you're at risk then of, um, of overfitting. So we want to kind of keep the real data away from the design process for as long as possible. We'll bring it right at the end and just to the absolute minimum of, of, of fitting. Because we need to do some fitting, right? Otherwise, we're not really quants. You know, we're just designing some random thing we think will work and seeing if it works. That's not really the way the world works. OK, so th this has all been quite waffly so far. So let's make it really concrete. What process should you follow if you're going to design a trading strategy? Um, the first thing you need to do is, is start with, I'm, I'm going to explain each of these things throughout the presentation, but I'll just read them out now. Start with a sound framework which imposes some conditions. Come up with the idea, of course. You may think that should be, be first, but actually, I think it's better to start with a framework. And it's a general framework, so it can be applied to any strategy. Use some random data or a single scenario of real data, plus theory and common sense, to develop the algorithm. Use fake data to fit the algo. And I'll put fit in quotes there, because it will be a fitting process. But because it's fake data, it's 
You know, it's a bit, it's a bit weird um, what we're doing. And we're not, just to repeat the point, we're not just going to be fitting for best performance, we're going to be fitting for other metrics as well. Um, then we will use some real data, um, and basically that's going to be for two reasons. Firstly, a, a sort of classic parameter sensitivity check, which is to say, have we by fluke found an extreme value of a parameter? Um, and actually, either side of that, you know, you've got the classic thing where the performance and the behavior just drops away and becomes awful. Have we made that mistake somehow by accident? It's, it's quite unlikely with fake data to do that, but it can happen. Um, but also as a sense check. So I know that trend following works or has worked in the past in certain markets. Um, if, if I create this thing that, that captures trends and is designed well and works, and then put real market data through it, it should be profitable when trend falling was profitable, profitable and vice versa. If it isn't, then I've screwed up. So this is kind of the check you haven't screwed up step. And then finally, we're going to do the, the, the only fitting we'll do with real data, which is to fit the risk capital allocation we're putting into um, the, the, the strategy um, or the, the, the set different sets of parameters within the strategy. And we'll do that using real data. But that's explicit fitting, so it's the least bad kind of fitting. Um, so we'll do it properly, in other words, out of sample and in a robust way. And I'll explain why this, this kind of fitting is like the least bad kind of fitting you can do. So step one, start with the sound framework. So um, I will now very briefly push my book. Um, <laughs> there's a question, please, sir. Fake data. What do I mean by fake data? Yeah, because you're yeah, you know, I'll, I'll come on to that. Yeah, I'll tell you what fake data is. Okay. Um, yeah, um, it's pretty. When you see it, you'll be like, oh yeah, obviously it's fake. Um, right. So if you if you want a more kind of complete explanation of what this this pretty slide means, you'll need to spend like fifty dollars on Amazon for the print version. But I'll quickly go through it now because it's important to understand. Um, the framework. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily matter what kind of framework you're using as long as you have one. I'll explain why that's important. Um, but don't think this is the only way of, of doing this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, this framework, for example, doesn't play very well with relative value strategies. You need to make some tweaks to make it work. And it doesn't play very well in situations where you've got limited leverage or no leverage and you want to achieve quite high risk or quite high returns. But anyway, you start with a bunch of trading rules. Um, and each of these rules could have um, it could be like variations on themes, so it could, they could be the same algo with different parameters, or they could be different algos or a mixture of both of those things. Um, and then what we do is we um, basically take a weighted average of the forecasts of these rules, and I'll explain what that means later, um, and we use that to forecast an individual market. Um, and I call these um, trading subsystems because they're part of the overall trading system. Um, so that's this step here. We then do some risk targeting and position sizing, so we end up with, with positions. And then finally, we, we put that into a portfolio of multiple instruments. So that's, that's kind of it, really. That's all you need to know. Um, OK, so these are the conditions um, within my um, framework. Um, and this is quite a lot, a lot of words on this slide, but I'll try and explain it as quickly as possible, because it's not necessarily important to understand this in detail. The important point is that by creating this framework, I've created a kind of a structure in which I can drop different trading rules with a minimum amount of extra work. Um, and if you go on my website, you can download it for free in Python. And I'll probably get around to doing a quantop quantopian implementation at some point as well. Um, so what do trading rules do? Trading rules make forecasts of risk-adjusted price changes. And these forecasts are continuous. They're not discrete entry and exit conditions. So you, it's not a situation why, where you go, oh, I'm, I'm now going to buy hold something, or I'm now going to sell, you, you're always kind of in the market, always making a forecast about what the price will do next, and then trading to adjust your position accordingly. Um, the forecasts are scaled in such a way that, that they're, not, they're independent of the instrument you're trading and the time period you're trading in. There's no sort of magic numbers that you have to kind of plug in to make it work for different markets. The forecast is proportional to the expected Sharpe ratio, which, of course, is just the, the mean over the standard deviation. And I note in passing that... Um, in you know, kind of classic portfolio optimization, your position um, should be proportional to mu over sigma squared. Um, in other words, your position will be proportional to the forecast divided by the standard deviation. So that, this means that no matter what the volatility of the instrument or the fact that volatility is changing over time, this, this, 
the forecasts can be compared very easily. So the trading rule doesn't need to know its trading, necessarily need to know its trading S&P 500 and its 1999 and the volatility is at a particular level. That's all managed by the framework. Um, the, the expected, we have to kind of impose some scaling. So the expected absolute value of the forecast is 10. It could, that could be any number, I just use 10. Uh, in principle, all fa forecasts will be used at all markets. That may change later if, when we do the optimization in the, the last stage. Um, if we're going to try and capture different time frames, we should use multiple variations of the same trading rule. So in other words, one algorithm, lots of different parameters. And we want to try and capture what's going on in multiple time frames because momentum seems to occur over multiple time frames. Um, but we don't want these things to be too highly correlated or you know, it's kind of going to be a waste of effort having loads of them if they're all 99% correlated. So we want to have a kind of a certain number of trading rule variations, sort of just enough, like a Goldilocks amount. So not like just one, so we miss all the stuff that's going on in other time frames, but not also not like a thousand because that's ridiculous. Um, okay, costs are the most important thing in finance, and the second most important thing in finance is costs. Okay, <laughs> people in this industry do not spend nearly enough time thinking about costs. Um, it, it's you know you really need to spend a lot of time thinking about costs. And a big part of the design, designing a trading strategy is that there's a lot of thinking about costs involved in it. You'll see me thinking about costs much more than pre-cost performance. Um, and the reason for that is that costs are highly predictable, but returns are very relatively unpredictable. So even if you knew in the past um, that the market was going to stay stable and you knew with certainty that the, the returns you were getting in the future were drawn from the same distribution, you knew that distribution absolutely perfectly, you knew, in other words, you knew what an econometrician would call the data generating model, which you don't, of course, you don't know that. But even if you knew that, there'd still be a huge amount of uncertainty about what your performance would be over, say, a five-year period. Um, you know, returns are really unpredictable. This means in practice we need to throw away systems that are too expensive. Um, but because we're designing not fitting, we don't do that by creating, you know, the trading strategy and backtesting it and including costs in the back test, and then seeing, oh, this lost a lot of money, we'll throw that one out. We don't need to do any of that. Um, the other thing we want to do is not necessarily trade really slow systems, um, and that's because the, the law of active management basically says the slower you trade, the less your sort of performance you can expect. Um, and at some point, you might as well just give up and become a buy and hold investor. So, um, okay, so you remember these questions from earlier. All of these unanswered questions. Now, the really great thing about imposing a framework like this is I can just press the right button, put a whole bunch of red lines through these things. Um, all of these things here are managed by the framework. So, for example, entry and exit. Well, as I said, we've got continuous forecasts. We don't need separate entry and exit rules. Um, we don't have a stop loss rule. The, you know, the risk management within the framework manages that. And also, if you're trend following, that kind of does a stop loss for you as well. Um, position sizing is managed by the framework. We, in principle, we're going to try and get all markets to trend follow. Um, so we're not going to have any kind of identification that, oh, no, we shouldn't trade corn because that's not really good for trend following. We'll let the risk, the optimization at the end, work out whether statistically you can make those right kinds of decisions or not. So the only thing we need to do is identify how strong the trend is. So we've only got one question to answer. Um, so our life has been made a lot easier. Right, second thing you've got to do is come up with the idea. Why do you even have to identify the strength of the trend? Um, if nothing else, I need to know whether I need to want to be long or short. Um, and the other thing about the way that the framework works is that it makes forecasts that are proportional to the expected chart ratio. In other words, if I think the market's going up a lot, then I want to be more bullish and have a bigger position on. So I need to identify both the sign and how strong the forecast is. That's the thing I need to, the other thing I need to identify. Make sense? No. No. OK. Well, you know what? I think we're going to. You haven't, unless I missed something, yeah. you haven't indicated how on earth you're going to forecast where the market is going. OK. So this is the tacit knowledge thing. I'm assuming that trend following works. Yeah. I'm assuming that if the market has gone up in the past, it will continue going up. Um, that may not be true, of course. Um, and the whole trend following industry will die, which would be quite, quite sad for me because most of my friends work there, and for me too because I've got money in the strategy. Um, but I'm kind of ignoring that possibility as we always do. I'm assuming the past repeats itself. 
But rather than needing to look at a whole bunch of data to work out what happened in the past, I just know that trend following works because I've got all this tacit knowledge in my head. So if I then, from that assumption, say, well, I know trend following works, I'm going to assume that all I need to do is, work, is kind of have some way of measuring what the trend is. Um, and then the framework will then translate that into a, into a, into a position. Okay. I mean, I always thought trend following was based on the idea that the market tells you. The market gets you in, the market gets you out, that you're not forecasting. In fact, beyond the fact that you believe that trends... Yeah, I mean, this is a, like a deep philosophical argument we can't have now, really. Okay. Uh, but I, I, just to say, I don't really believe with those kinds of people. Anyone who's putting a trade on is forecasting because they think they know what's going to happen in the future. So those people are, I'm being recorded, they're full of brown, sticky stuff. Oh. Yep. So, uh, on a previous slide, yep. uh, when you were designing the framework, uh, there is a statement that the system is continuous, so there are no entry rights. Correct. Do you implicitly state that trading systems where you do stay out of the market and then get in yep. are somehow bad? OK, so, yeah. sorry, go on. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but that's kind of, when the forecast, let's suppose say you're long, so your forecast is positive. As it go, shrinks and then passes through zero, you'll implicitly be closing and then reopening a new short position. Yeah. To go back to your first question, um, which I've forgotten already. Uh, is a strategy that spends part of the time. Oh, yeah. Is a strategy that, that does use explicit, explicit entry and exit rules somehow inferior? Um, if you make the assumption that there is a correlation between how strong your forecast is and the ex post performance of your trading rule, then you, you should use a continuous system. In practice, when you test it, because one of the problems with, say, futures trading is if you're a small investor, it's quite hard to hold sufficiently large numbers of futures contracts to have a truly continuous system. You know, so you, you might only be able to, to have a, a binary system just because you've only got enough margin to just buy one contract or sell one contract. So you can actually test how, kind of, how much damage that does to your performance. And the answer is it does do some damage. In other words, if you, if you possibly can, you should try and have a continuous system. But it's not like a, a huge mess. Yeah, it doesn't really kill your performance. I'm going to move on if that's OK, because we're a bit short of time now. OK, come up with the idea. So what are, you know, uh, humans, before computers, humans would just look at these wavy, wiggly lines and just draw lines through them, right? And this was a highly specialized and elite profession done by people wearing green eye shades. Um, so how can we kind of replicate that? So I've, I, I'm using re linear regression. The reason I'm using it is, um, so I, my kind of core trend following system is, is exponentially weighted moving average crossovers. My problem is I kind of have so much tacit knowledge about exponentially weighted moving average crossovers um, that I, I was sort of was worried that I would, you know, be constraining the design process too much right from the beginning. You know, I'd bring, be bringing in too much tacit knowledge. So I thought I'd start with something I'd never used before, um, and therefore I had no preconditional ideas about, you know, what might be a, a, a good parameter or a bad parameter, say. Um, so it's just linear regression using ordinary least squares. Um, this is by no means an original idea, and in fact, I think Andreas Kleinau, who's one of the other speakers in one of his books, uses something similar. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is, is use statistics to draw this line. And basically these are all data points, all the closing prices, daily data, data points. And we just draw a line through there that's the best fit. Um, and then we measure the beta. And the beta is the slope. Um, in other words, it's the how fast the price is advancing or declining. Um, and I... Um, you know, so the only question we need to answer is, how far back do we look to draw these lines? So you know, it's a rolling regression over the last n weekdays to capture different length trends. So the only question we have to answer is, how big should n be? And I call that a window size. Um, OK, so that's the trading rules. It's dead simple. Um, probably, it's probably the simplest way you could possibly capture momentum, I think, in a systematic way. Right. So. Step three, use some random data or single scenario of real data plus theory and common sense to develop the algo. So let's use a real scenario, which is 2008, which some of you may know is quite exciting. Um, so if I looked at the one-year returns between uh, January 2008 and January 2009, so a rolling window of a year, um, and look at what the market did, and look at the slope of this black line, it's a beta of minus 564.1%. 
S&P 500, sorry, I should have said, that's the S&P 500 points a year. So if that trend continued at that rate, you know, then the year after the S&P would lose another 500 points. Obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> um, trend following is not always right. Yeah, is that a question? Or someone was laughing? Yeah, okay, good. Laugh, laughs are good. He, oh. Where are you calculating the slope? Because right now this is the slope of all the data points that you have right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I would, um, it's now the 1st of January 2009. I want to know what my forecast is, and that will determine what my position will be as I, as I wake up in the morning. So I'm, in this particular case, I'm using a very long window. Um, okay, so remember, these are all the conditions we had before in our trading system. The important thing here is a forecast to scale in an instrument temporal way. There are no magic numbers. Um, so we're now going to start a design process. We're going to start thinking about the algorithm and asking ourselves questions about whether it's a well-designed algorithm. Um, does this scale well? No, and that's just common sense. You don't even need to, to draw the S&P 500. Um, clearly, minus 500, which is the, the number, will have a completely different meaning in another futures contract. And it would also have a completely different meaning in, in, in a um, time period when volatility was a lot lower, because everything should be volatility normalized. Um, well, this is quite an easy problem to solve. So I said forecast should be proportional to the expected sharp ratio versus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Well, the beta is in units of change in price, yeah. So the forecast, the revised rule now is to say, well, we'll take the beta, we'll take the slope of the regression, and we just divide by the standard deviation, the vo recent volatility. And you can use like a 30-day you know, volatility or something like that. Volatility is relatively predictable. So using historic volatility is kind of OK. Um, and this is just theory. I mean, this comes from theory, you know, maths done by people in the, in the night, well, Harry Markovitz in the 1950s, which you don't need to have any data to do that maths, right? Okay, so this is the second iteration of our algo, and now what I've done is um, I've, I've got some real data, and you're like, rather well, using real data, but I'm not looking at performance. So when you're designing rather than fitting, you should, it's okay to use real data sparingly, especially here, I'm just using one market, so, you know, it's, it's, I'm avoiding designing the strategy so that it only works on one market. Um, but you should never look at performance until right at the end when you, you, you actually have to. Um, so what's plotted here is the, the actual value of beta. So the y-axis goes from minus 40 to plus 60. Um, and the, the range of forecasts, apart from this bit at the beginning, which I'll talk about in a second, is between, I don't know, minus 35 and plus 30. Um, so that's actually quite good because the... the um, just by coincidence, actually, the expected absolute value of this is about 10. But in practice, the trading system framework will, will cope with situations where it's not exactly 10, because that's just a coincidence, actually, um, by creating a scaling parameter. And that's all done on a rolling out a sample basis. OK, so it looks pretty good, apart from this gnarly bit at the beginning. And the reason that's happening is that um, although we're using a year of data, at the beginning here, we didn't have a year of data. We only well, on day one, we had one day of data. On day two, we had two days of data. Um, um, you, need a, you need a minimum of two days to, to draw a regression line. So uh, after two days, it started drawing a regression line. But because there was very little data, it's very noisy. Um, so scales well, yes. Oh, does it, sorry, one other thing. Does the behavior make sense? So does it behave like a trend-following algorithm should? So in 2008, which is about here, it was massively short because the market had been going down. Um, after 2010, this is a one-year look back, so it's quite slow, um, it was mostly positive because the market's been going up. And only you know, um, last year did it briefly go bearish. So it, it's behaving like a trend-following algorithm good. So we can tick that box. OK. Um, sorry, the other thing to say, sorry, is sp so costs are important, which means the speed of things is also very important. Um, how fast do things actually trade? So there should be a kind of rough relationship between the, the length of trends you're looking at and how fast you trade. So if you're looking at one-year trends that are really slow, but your thing is churning over every single day, you've got a very badly designed algorithm. And there are quantitative ways of measuring that, which we'll come to. But even now, just eyeballing that plot, it's pretty obvious this is a fairly slow system. So that's good, that's good, that's good. Is there anything weird? Yes, we've got this initial bumpy thing here. The way of dealing with that is just to tell um, the, the Python function that's doing the regression that we need to create a, a window at the beginning when we don't try and estimate a forecast. Um, so just 
I just said, well, let's take the window size and divide by four. In other words, if you've got a one year look back, which is about 256 trading days, then don't do anything until you've got 64 trading days. So that just gets rid of that little lump at the beginning. And again, this is just common sense. I mean, if anyone who knows anything about re regressions would have, would have realized this was going to happen even before they're you know, plotting it. The other thing to say is that I said earlier we don't want to trade too slowly. We might just be buy and hold. I personally think that one year look back is probably about as slow as you want to go. And there's also a technical point, which is that um, beyond a year, the, the standard deviation of the error in the regression increases with the factor of root t, um, which means that the, you can't use standard OLS because all, all of the, the assumptions are broken. Um, and um, so you need to have a short enough time period that you can assume that stock price changes are normal rather than log normal, essentially. And if you didn't understand any of that, don't worry, it's not important. But it's good to throw in a little bit of geek, isn't it, you know, every now and then in these presentations, just so people know you do vaguely know what you're talking about. What is LAM? Oh, law of active management, sorry, which just says that the, the faster you trade, the more money you make, and the converse is also true. Sorry. Okay, goodness me, where are we? Okay, right, so back to the conditions. So we use multiple variations of the same trading rules. So that's the same algo with different parameters, and costs are very important. So bearing those things in mind, we're moving to the next stage, which is using fake data. So fake data is going to answer basically the single question, what values should we use for the window size? Um, so we want to understand, firstly, the relationship between trend lengths and window size. We want to have an understanding of how, what the kind of trading speed of different window sizes will be in a, more, in a more quantitative way. We'll, we'll then prune any window sizes that are likely to be too expensive. We'll also prune any window sizes that are likely to be too slow. And the other thing we're going to do is use fake data to look at the correlation of the same algo with different parameters, different window sizes. So if you've got a window size of 120, what's the correlation between that and a window size of 130 and 140? What's the correlation between a window size of 10 and one of 256? Um, and with that correlation structure, we can then work out how many of these things we're going to need and sort of how they should be spaced out. So should we have a window size of, of 10 and 250? Is, is, is that enough? Or, or you know, do we need like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up to 256? You know, what, what should we do? This will make more sense in, in a few slides when you've actually seen it happening. OK, so we need to generate some fake data. So what I'm going to do is I want to generate some fake data in which trends exist. And the easy way of doing that is you start with a sort of a sawtooth, and then you, you just jam some normal noise on top of that, a random walk. And you end up with something that, that, to my eyes at least, convincingly looks like a, a price series that has some trends in it at certain lengths. And just for fun, get one of your chartist friends to look at that and ask them to predict you know, what's going to happen next. Um, and ask them which market it was as well, see if they can identify it. Um, oh, and if you want to do this yourself, there's some, it's like 20 lines of Python code, which you can find on my website. OK, so, right. OK, what's going on here? So these numbers here are all different values of n, OK, different window sizes, all the way from 5, which is a week of business days, all the way up to 256, which is about a year. Each column is a different set of fake data with different underlying trend lengths in it. So in other words, here I've got trends that last for about a month. Here I've got trends that last for about three months, six months, uh, nine months, and a year. And what I'm showing here is the average Sharpe ratio. And it has to be an average, right, because I've got loads of, I'm generating this stuff randomly, so any individual thing could be biased. So I want to get loads and take an average. It's the average Sharpe ratio of this n length training system given a, a price series that naturally has trends of these, these lengths. And these, this is really great, right? We've not used any real data to get to this point. But looking at this table, you get a lot of really rich information and intuition about how trend-following systems work. So the first thing we can say is that this kind of, in bold here, I've put the highest value in each column. In other words, which value of n is optimal for a given trend length? So it looks like, for example, for a one-month trend, a two, roughly a one- to two-week window is kind of good. And that relationship holds all the way down. So the best possible trend-following system, if you know in advance how long your trends are going to be, is a system where you have a look back that's roughly about a half or a third the size of the, the, the actual trends that are happening. Um, 
And the other thing is you get this pattern where either side of that, things, um, the Sharpe ratio is not so good. So if you've got a relatively slow trend, for example, um, there's not really much, you know, fast systems are still profitable, but not as good as the optimal. Um, and the worst thing you can possibly do is use a trend following system that's too slow. So, for example, with trend lengths of a month, once I get a look back that's greater than a month, my performance just gets hammered. And the reason that happens is you end up basically having a look back that exactly gets you in the market chops. You end up um, buying here and selling here, and you get absolutely hammered. Um, and we, where I used to work, we used to call this the frequency of death <laughs> for obvious reasons. Because you know some of these sharps are awful. Yeah, exactly. Um, I haven't gone beyond 256 for the reasons I've already explained. Okay, that's really that's really interesting. I think um, the other thing we can do is measure the turnover. Um, so how fast are these things trading? How much is it turning over its position in a year? Um, and th these numbers actually, it doesn't really matter what the underlying trend lengths are like. These numbers are fairly consistent. So there's just a single column here. So basically. If your look back is a week, your turnover is about 176 times a year. So you're, every day, and a, day, day and a half, you're basically buying and selling your entire position. So that's pretty, that's pretty fast. Um, way back, um, you know, if your trend length's uh, a year, um, your turnover is, is, is six, which obviously is a lot lower. The other thing to note is that um, there's sort of an asymptotic relationship going on here in that um, it, it, this is really fast, then it tails off quite quickly, and then beyond here, you don't really get much change in turnover. So the, these systems have all got, are going to have fairly similar costs. So let's look at costs. So again, it doesn't matter what the fake, fake data is in terms of frequency, the numbers are all the same. But these two columns are basically, I'm using the costs from two futures markets, the S&P 500, which is really cheap, and the euro dollar futures market, which is really expensive. And the, the difference between their costs is actually almost exactly a factor of 10. Um, and the units here are in basis points per year. So um, if you're trading a one-week system in the S&P 500, it will cost you um, about uh, 18 basis points a year in costs. That's, that's pretty cheap. If you're doing that in euro dollar futures, it'll cost you nearly 2% in costs a year, which you might think is not very much, but that's huge, right? That's, that's really expensive. Um, and obviously, the slower you trade, the cheaper it gets. Now, for reasons that are too boring to go into, I, when I'm fitting trading systems or designing them for that matter, I impose a maximum of 13 basis points a year in costs. Um, and you may think, well, that sounds very low, but I explain why I'm thing. Um, these are all in sharp ratio units as well, by the way. So these, this is 13 basis points of sharp ratio, not, not return. Um, there's not really any point in using N5, because even with the cheapest possible market, it's still it's more than, going to cost more than 13. So I can throw that row away. And the other thing I can say is, well, I, I know that with euro dollar, there's going to be no point having an N um, faster than or smaller than 85, because it just gets too expensive. So I'm making all of these design decisions just on fake data, right? It's good. OK. Oh, the other thing I want to do is look at the correlation structure. Now, it turns out, and if you're really smart, you can prove this with a pencil and a piece of paper. But if you have a window size, you start with a window size of, well, we know that we're going to have to start with 10 because 5 is too expensive. If you start with 10 and then you increase your window sizes in jumps of square root 2, in the words 10, 14, whatever 14 times 1.4, blah, blah, blah is, um, then the correlation between the, the adjacent um, trading rules is about 0.9. Um, and the correlation between trading rules that are further apart is less than 0.9. So if you take the view that I do, that there's not much point in, in trading things which are more correlated than 0.9, um, then you, um, you, know, you can use this rule, basically, to generate the right window sizes. OK. So quick summary of our findings. We know that having window size in route two steps covers the space. We know that having a window size less than 10 is too expensive, no matter what we're trading. We know that having a window size greater than 200 is just pointless. So that, that enables us to come up with this list of window sizes. Um, you can only have integer window sizes because we've got daily data, by the way. So, and we know this will probably capture trends lasting for around one month to about 18 months, which is kind of the sweet spot of trend following. 
slower than that, mean reversion tends to happen, faster than that, mean reversion tends to happen. And that's, that's tacit knowledge, right? I've not used any data to come up with that statement. OK. We're now going to use some real data, sharp intake of breath. OK. First thing I'm going to check is, is the scaling consistent? Um, now, for reasons that are obvious or irrelevant, depending on who you are, the higher your window size, the, the, um, it'll, it'll, the, the, the naturally, the bigger your forecast will be. OK. So this number here is the number the training system calculates to scale everything so that the absolute value is 10. Um, so it doesn't really matter that these numbers increase. In fact, I'd expect that to happen. Um, what's important is that across markets, these numbers are fairly similar. So I've, I've come, my, my framework conditions have been satisfied. I could also do a similar exercise over time and check that the, the scaling over time is consistent. I haven't done that, but trust me, it is. Right, the other thing I could do is check turnover. So this is now with real data. So um, if you were to go back to the previous slide, and it's too far back for me to do it, but I think this was 76 in the fake data. So we've successfully, we know that our fake data is not giving us crazy answers because the turnover that comes out is very similar. So any decisions I made about which things to pick because of costs, I know those decisions are still valid even in the real world. So I'm not, I've not used real data to make those decisions. I'm just using the real data to check how to do something stupid by generating fake data that's unrealistic. Um, and I can do the same thing with costs. So um, remember before that really <laughs> that the, with S&P 500, it was just on the cusp of being OK with N of 10. Sharp ratio costs of 0.1, of 0.1 a year. I, for some random reason here, the, these are now in the previous slide, the numbers divided by 100, but anyway. Um, whereas for euro dollar, which is really expensive, you know, uh, these things here, I just can't trade them because all the numbers are above 0.13. And corn and US 10-year fits in the middle somewhere. OK, correlation structure. When I actually estimate the correlation of all of these window sizes with real data, the highest correlation between any two adjacent pairs is 0.85, not the 0.9 in the fake data. Um, and the, intuitively, so it's not a million miles away, so I'm happy with the decision I've made. And actually, intuitively, it kind of makes sense that's happening because the fake data has got a lot of structure in it because it starts with these sawtooth waves, and that, on that, that pushes the correlations up unnaturally above what you'd actually get in reality. OK, I am now going to fit. OK, so it's three minutes past 12. So I've been talking for you know, about 52 minutes or whatever. And only at this point in my presentation, I'm actually going to move to fitting with real data. And this is the first and last time I will look at performance, OK? So remember, in principle, all forecasts are used in all markets. So we combine forecasts by taking a weight of average of forecasts. Um, the forecasts are all in a consistent scaling, independent of volatility. So these weights will depend on three things, the pre-cost performance, which may be different by market, the costs, which are definitely different by market, and the correlation of these, of these Fs. This is a classic portfolio optimization problem. It has well-known problems and well-known solutions. Um, but we have to do this. And the main reason we have to do it is, if I haven't looked at performance, there's always the danger I'm going to design this trading rule that looks amazing, is cheap to trade, but loses money consistently. And obviously, I don't want to do that. Um, OK. Is it, why is it better to do this than to fit the parameters of your trading system? Well, there's a number of reasons. One is the parameter space is much smaller. So. Um, I've got, I think, eight of these things. So I've only got seven degrees of freedom. That's a lot less than I'd probably have if I was fitting the, the, the parameters directly. Um, it's feasible to do rolling out a sample because it's not a really complicated like machine learning thing. Um, the, the, for technical reasons, the actual surface of the function you're optimizing is relatively well behaved. Um, and there are well-developed techniques to, to cope with all of these problems and to kind of find the right degrees of freedom. It, basically. You know, it's, it's much harder to, to do implicit fitting of portfolio weights, I think, it, for me at least. OK, so basically, we, we start off with this is now some performance data, real performance data, OK? This is all you're getting. So these are the, each of the individual ends. So for example, this line here is um, N20, 20-day 20 look back. Um, and the reason why this happens is just to do with an error in my code. It's not really important. Um, 
So this is going to go into the optimization algorithm to do the fitting. An important thing to note is, if I looked at these earlier, I might have gone, oh, oh my goodness, these lines lose money. I don't want to trade those, and I would have done some implicit fitting. So that's ex not looking at these graphs is exactly, you avoid those kinds of dangers. And if I combine them together, I'm only trading four instruments, so this is never going to be spectacular. But, but the important thing for me is this thing makes money when trend following has made money in the past. So in 2008, it makes a lot of money. It makes a lot of money, a bit of money in, in 2014. The last few years haven't been so kind to it. You, know, um, you get the classic trend following performance, which is big jumps and then slow bleeds, big jumps and slow bleeds when the market is range bound. OK. I think I'm almost out of time. Um, so basically, there are three ways to overfit. One of them you can't do anything about. But you should embrace and use your tacit knowledge and design your trading strategies using the process I've described to you. Um, and there's some free advertising. And it's question and answer time. A round of applause first, though, I think. <laughs> Yeah. In your regression, right? So let's assume you, you have. You want Sorry, regression. What regression? You, you, you said linear regression. Right? Oh, um, well, I'm only doing one regression at a time on an individual market to work out whether that market's got a yeah, trend yeah, in it. That's, uh, actually my yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, if uh, for one market, uh, QI, the other market, ES, yeah. you try to use all the, let's say you have 20 available markets, information you can build in your regression. Yeah. Naturally, they cannot be the same regression. How you? Well, no, I do. I do the, the, the trading rule. The way the trading rule works, the algo works, is it looks at the a price uh -huh. in the past yeah. of an instrument, draws a regression line for the points, and works out what the forecast should be, and it does this for every single market individually. So that means you don't use TY's information to trade ES. No, I mean in principle you could do that, um, and um, but you don't do that. Yeah, so the question is whether, whether I'm doing some kind of multivariate regression in my trading rule, but it's not. It's purely univariate. Um, the, you could do that, of course, but in this simple example, you, you wouldn't. All right. Next question. Yes? How do you reject your strategy in your process? How do I do what? Sorry? Reject your strategy. Reject it? Yeah. What's the criteria? Well, actually, if you're being really, uh, really anal and doing your, the, this thing properly, you'd never actually reject a strategy. You would let it stay in your back test even if the allocation went down to zero. Now, the important thing is that will only happen if this thing is so awful that it's statistically significantly awful. Um, and that, that's actually quite unusual with these kinds of trading strategies. It takes a long time to be, to be sure that's happening. Um, and the reason you would keep it in your back test, even if you'd end up not trading it because it's ended up with a weight of zero, is it means your, your, your historic sharp ratio is not going to be inflated. You, you'll actually be realistically, because it, in reality, it would have taken you 20 years to work out that this is a bad idea. Uh, yes? How did you pick a periodicity for the fake data? Okay, so the question is what the periodicity of the, of the fake data. So the answer is I just picked those periods, firstly, because I know that trends tend to happen not too fast, not too slow, tacit knowledge. Secondly, the results don't vary that much if you change those periods a little bit. So the results for a one-month underlying trend in the fake data is very, very similar to the one with a five-week trend length. So it's not that important in this case what period you pick. There are obviously other applications of the design process where it would be really important to pick the right parameters, but this isn't one of them. Uh, yes? Okay, um, my cost estimate is basically um, the sum of um, the commission and the um, slippage market impact. The difference between the, you know, the, the middle of the bid ask spread and where I, you'd actually end up trading in practice, given, you know, and if you're a small trader, you, you'll, you know, you sort of assume pessimistically you have to cross the spread, so you pay half the bid ask spread. If you're a bigger trader, you need to do complicated cost modeling. Um, and then all I do is I, I take that number and I, divide it by the volatility of the market to work out the, the cost and sharp ratio units so I can compare it across markets. Um, and it's chapter 13 of the book, I think, <laughs> if you want more detail. Any more questions? Um, I'll take, oh, you guys have been asking a lot of questions, but I will take yours. <laughs> um, 
because it's bound to be controversial. No, um, I, you, you mentioned a couple of times that the, the position weight was uh, proportional to the Sharpe ratio. The, for, the forecast is proportional the to the Sharpe ratio, sorry. yeah. And therefore, for, therefore uh, proportional to uh, mu over sigma squared. No, mu over sigma. But what was the two then? Um, so when you want to come to actually calculating what your position is, you need to divide by sigma again. Because if a market's really risky, you have a, you'd have a smaller position for a given forecast level. Because okay. you're, well, you're, you're basically targeting a given level of risk. So what you do is say, depending on how confident I am about you know, my forecast of a particular market, I want to target a particular level of risk. Um, so to target a particular level of risk, I need to divide my forecast by volatility um, to, so that more volatile markets um, have smaller positions which me, which, um, so you know, if, if let two markets which were identical in every respect, um, except that one had twice the volatility of the other, but they're the same forecast, you'd have half the position in a more volatile market to give you the same amount of risk. Okay, I, I guess what I never really understood about this, let's say the Sharpe ratio is one. Yeah. And the mu is 20% and the so yep. is 20%. Yeah. So now I'm going to divide by 20%. Yeah. Oh, again. Yeah. So or 40% perhaps from a volatile market. Well, because okay. for, for a given for a given like unit of thing, um, buying one unit of thing in the less risky market is going to generate 20% of risk a year. Buying one unit of thing in the more risky market is going to generate risk of 40% a year. But I want because I've got the same forecast in both markets, I want the same amount to get the same amount of expected risk. So I need to buy half a thing of the riskier market to get the same risk. That might be better, yeah. I'm studiously ignoring you because uh, I will come back to you if there's no more questions, but, but yes. Well, I mean, it's a kind of universal truth that the slower you're trading, the slower, your, slower kind of any decay or change in market structure should affect you. So our last presentation I went to was a high-frequency trading presentation. I would imagine that those guys have to refit their stuff every few months because the, the kinds of effects, there's a guy nodding in front, he obviously knows this. The kind of effects they're capturing are, you know, because they're quite close to pure arbitrage in many cases, if once people find out about them, they, they just disappear. The kinds of effects, this really slow trading speed, you know, they've been around for a long time. Whether they'll exist in the future, I don't know, but the, the things that drive them they're not changing very much, and occasionally they do badly because of idiosyncratic events, but you know, generally they're not changing very much. So what that means in practice is if you've got, say, a 30-year 30, 30 backtest, and you've designed a trading strategy and fitted some allocations over 30 years, like a year later, you've now got 31 years of data. So your data set's changed by 3%. So even if the world completely changed in that year, you still wouldn't do very much. It might take quite a long time before you had to kind of catch up with the way the world has changed. Um, so there has to be a, an alignment between how, how, what sort of speed you're trading at and how, how kind of quickly you have to refit your systems. In this world, with this kind of speed of trading and this kind of style of trading, I would argue that, that you could probably get away with never, never refitting your system. Where I used to work, we did it every year, at least. Um, I don't think I've changed my parameters since December 2014. Because I'm lazy. It's a lot of work. Go on. Okay, so you get to ask the last question. I appreciate that. <laughs> so all these are based on a very big assumption is a trend exists. Yep. But we know that from like uh, end of March last year, yep. like in 2016 year to day, uh, in 2016 CPU overall lost like 4%. Yeah, this, this really... And this year, year to day is more like flat or flat. Yep. So the question would become, Beyond the model yeah. or regression, whatever, so yeah. how you can tell yourself or convince yourself that it works, continues to work. Okay, so the question is whether the, the, about the big assumption that trends will continue to exist in the future, whether recent poor performance kind of affects that assumption. Well, in terms of whether recent poor performance changes your assumptions, I refer you back to the previous question. You need a lot of data for these slow systems to really show you that actually they don't seem to be, they seem to be doing badly. I'll give you a very specific example. Relatively fast trend following on equity index futures seems to have made no money since about 1990. Okay. 
uh, that the account curve looks like a dog leg. It goes up and then it's flat. Now, if you then actually statistically test whether you can say, is this broken, you, you get, a, do you understand about p-values? Um, you get a p-value of like 30%. And normally for a statistical significance, you'd want 5%. So you just, in a, you look at the account curve and as a human being, you think, oh my goodness, this thing's broken. But in a statistical sense, you don't have enough data to actually say that. All the data tells you is you probably shouldn't have quite as big a weight in that thing as you would do if, if that you know, poor performance wasn't there. But you shouldn't, you've got nowhere near enough data to throw it away. And going back to the first thing you said about making this big assumption, well, heck, this entire conference is about making the assumption that the past will repeat itself in the future in some way. So, you know, I'm not embarrassed about, about saying that I believe that. Um, and, um, and that's a really good note to finish on, I think. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.